Hello guys, it's one of other beautiful day for you. For me, I'm recording this in the same day which I recorded the last video. It's fine. So today, I'm going to explain one of the most confusing topic. Uh, I get a lot of questions regarding the microservices. I get few questions about serverless, but I get uh, some questions asking, sometimes they're providing their problem and asking whether they should go with the serverless, whether they should go with the microservices. I want to explain this because this question doesn't make any sense. Okay, uh, before we discuss this, we need to understand what is microservices and what is uh, serverless or something else, right? And before that, you need to do one thing, you need to subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed yet, because there will be some fantastic topic we discuss in a different way. Okay, anyway, so, in, in this uh, software engineering world, there are two things. One is protocol, other one is architecture. So different between protocol and architecture is this. So if you get a SOAP, it's a protocol. If you get the REST, it's an architecture. The difference is this. So let's say you want to build a house. When you want to build a house, you can go to an architect and or draftman and you can, hey, I need this requirement. I, this is my land size, I need uh, two bedrooms, I need one living room, kitchen, and I need the library room, whatever you require. Then they draw a nice house for you, probably 3D modeling, and it give back to you. So when you build this, right, it's like kind of a six month, one year process, depending on where you are. And then during that time, you want slight modification, right? Different window style, different size of windows, so something like that. So that means you can a little customize. Again, this depends on the country where you live, but technically we, we, we just can do little modification. So that means for the architecture, we can do the modification, but you need to make sure you know what you are doing and you should be able to take the risk, right? So it's the same thing for us. When it comes to microservices, it's an architecture. It is not a protocol, it is not a rule, it is not a platform. Right? It's an architecture. So that means you can use any platform, you can use any tools, you can use any language to de uh, uh, develop your microservices architecture. Right? So two things we need to fulfill with the microservices. Right? We discussed this before, but as a recap, one is independently deployable. Right? Independently deployable. The second one is it should be independently scalable. Plus, you should have a bounded context, right? Bounded context. If you need to uh, learn microservices in detail, there's a playlist of mine saying microservices, and you can go through that, irrespective of the language you work in, right? There's practical videos as well. The practical videos mainly focus on Java, but the microservice theory videos is it doesn't have any language. You can you can watch it, right? So now let's say you are going to design a system. To a, uh, some organization right so you can have employee service you can have a project service and you can have finance service you can have you can have any service like that so what is the criteria it should be independent deployable that mean in employee service should not go and peek into the uh, HR uh, service data in a database level it has to integrate with the rest service level or HTTP level right and then finance service, though finance service need employee, they should not go and peek to the employee database, right? They should handle everything in the HTTP layer, right? So then uh, in, if you follow that, you can independently deploy. Why? Because uh, when you deploy, because if let's say, let's say something like this, employee service and the HR service, right? So now employee service and HR service share the same database. Just assume something like that, right? So now what happened, we have a huge, uh, heavy traffic to the employee service, we need to scale this. You can scale the service, but still you are creating a bottleneck on the database, right? So if you do, if you not follow in the principle, you cannot scale this. So what do you mean modification? But still if someone is sharing database, that is not wrong, right? Only thing is you need to make sure you don't create a bottleneck on the scaling. If you see, okay, my employee service never go beyond 10 instances or something like that, so that uh, my database can handle it, perfectly fine. That means you can customize. 
in a microservice that's a principal one database per service not per instance per service but you will I, I always see people customize this even I have done that I use shared database within uh, for a couple of services that's fine All right so now independently scalable right so that, that, that is this problem right independently deployable you don't need to talk to employee service team or HR service team to deploy project service that means it's scalable Right? So now, bounded context, that means employee service should only care about the employees but should, should not worry about the project or anything else. That responsibility has to give it to that. So this is some brief. So now, what is serverless? Serverless is something completely different context. Once you build this, right, you can decide to build, build let's say you have uh, three services, right? So you have HR service, you have a project service, right? You have a finance service, right? Let's say this makes as an employee service, right? So you have three different services. You can uh, uh, develop this using Java. You can develop this using Nest, NestJS. You can develop this using Node plus Express. It's completely fine, right? So whatever the technology your team is expert, you can use the technology to deploy, develop this. But all the thing is, why they, is it possible? Because they talk to each other using HTTP, which is the common protocol across all the services. Because that is why we use HTTP, to, right? To make sure these are independent from each other. They can operate independently. So now, so now you can deploy this, you can deploy this on a docker plus docker swarm, right? You can deploy this with a docker plus Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes. You can deploy this on ECS, AWS ECS, completely fine, right? But what you need to consider is, if you're doing this, you should have a DevOps team. Okay, you should have a DevOps team. Why? They should be able to take care of creating clusters, administrating uh, Kubernetes clusters, and also have been probably administrating your ECS, ECR, all those things. And also you need to make sure the enough memory is uh, allocated for each Docker. Dockers are proper, uh, properly profiled, right? and the security, right? For example, sometimes people are just creating a Docker and Docker running on a root user. If someone is, uh, if your application is vulnerable, if someone is managed to come in, that user getting a root privileges, which is uh, dangerous, right? So you have to worry about all those things. Why? Because you are managing not only development, but the deployment as well. Right? You are managing the deployment as well. So, then what is serverless? Serverless mean, serverless mean, it has nothing to do with the microservices. Serverless mean, you only worrying about the program. Or you can call function. Or you can call development. You only worrying about this. You only worrying about this. You do not worrying about how this deploy, how to scale this. You don't have to worry about it, right? You don't have to worry about whether it's a Docker or a Kubernetes. You don't have to worry about uh, what is the uh, scaling size, right? You don't have to worry about whether it will have enough memory or not because you can profile this each your function. Hey, this function needs a 2 GB memory. This function needs a 1, um, 1 GB memory. This function is a 256 megabyte memory. You can do that. Plus, Plus, so when you uh, write a micro, when you write a uh, serverless program, then what you can do is, if you have a hundred requests, the scaling part will take care of by your uh, cloud itself, right? If it's AWS Lambda, then AWS is taking care of uh, your scaling part. You don't have to worry about it, right? You don't have to think about it. There are some disadvantages as well. Why? If you let's let's get the Let's get the advantage first. If you deploy this with the ECS or a Kubernetes, right? If you deploy this with the ECS or Kubernetes, 
instances are running on the cloud instances are running on the cloud right and then if it is a amazon if it is a aws you have to pay for hourly basis for easy uh, instances easy to instance you are running right and then uh, even though you are use or not certain functions you are paying because your instances are running but if you use a serverless function you bill you will charge for what you use if this service if the employee service is used uh, let's say 5 seconds right at a time so then you will charge for the memory and the processor used for that 5 seconds it doesn't bill for whole hour or something like that let's say this service ran like two times per hour for an entire day so that means it ran only 48 times right or 24 hours so that means you are paying let's say one time it's a, a 10 second right you're just paying only 480 seconds for this service whereas if you push into the EC2 or a, a, a ECS or a Kubernetes you are paying 24 hours rather you are paying for the 480 seconds right so that's a disadvantage, disadvantage over serverless the disadvantage of the serverless if you run on an ECS it's always running right when the request come it can instantly serve for that but if it is a serverless actually what happened behind the scene they have a docker not a docker but container so then you what your code will deploy to that container right it's like a sleeping the container is a sleeping state uh, I mean I'm not going to explain the servers in detail here if you get a serverless function either from API gateway either from in respect of the uh, AWS S3 or SQS right uh, from these type of um, triggering point can trigger to the servers and say hey you have a book wake up wake up right so then this this serverless function will wake up and come to do the job right so this wake up time we call call start right we call the call start the call start mean the service which is in the sleepy state has to come back and get the start to work so this delta time this time right not the delta so this time for the uh, what we uh, where it take is a call start time which is adding for the request to the latency that is kind of a disadvantage there are solution you can keep this warm right and you can pay for aws to keep this warm or you can send the request and like and a predefined time to keep it warm there are multiple ways you can do but in general in theory this uh, suffering this cold start problem so what i wanted to tell you is serverless is your deployment mechanism right it is not your development map i mean you're developing in a service way but it is a it is it, it just has nothing to do with the microservices you can completely write employee service and in our previous example employee service project service and the finance service in serverless right i will show you if you're interesting uh, to know how to do that just comment in this video or uh, send me uh, your feedback on my facebook page not facebook profile in a facebook page so then I will do an example, right? You can implement microservices uh, in a serverless, but that doesn't mean uh, you are not doing microservices. I'm doing serverless, but not the microservices. That's a completely wrong explanation. What you do is you design your system in the microservices as microservice, but you are implemented on serverless. That is a difference. You understand? Okay. So thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Stay safe. Take care.